Thank you for that very warm welcome, Father McShane. And Arnell, I wish you and your family many, many blessings in the future. I'm honored to be with you and appreciate the opportunity to participate in Fordham's second annual summit. Thank you for supporting this event and to the other speakers who will enrich the day. I was asked to talk a bit about myself, how I came to be at Fordham, and about giving. By way of introduction, I grew up on Long Island. Dad was a production manager in the garment industry, and Mom worked full time raising three children until we were old enough to make dinner for ourselves. At that point, she went to graduate school at NYU in the evenings, achieved two master's degrees, and had a successful career in job placement for young people with disabilities. My parents expected the same of my brother as the two girls. This was true around the house, as it was of our ambitions. I carry some of the classic traits of a middle order child. A diplomat and peacemaker, level-headed and constant, a harmonizer and problem solver, independent and resilient, and as neither the princeling nor the baby, I tend to be quieter and more private. It was an indirect path that brought me to Fordham, catalyzed by two providential signals in the months between undergrad and grad school. One pushed me away from the past, and the other tugged at the future. I played piano since I was four years old, and it always brought joy. The gradual, methodical journey to master a composition is immensely satisfying, intricate, and never quite finished. Playing is rhapsodic. When immersed in a piece, time and surroundings disappear. You become one with the instrument. If you are a musician, or dance, sculpt, paint, draw, write, you know the feeling. That was until senior year. I was completing a Bachelor of Music and Performance at Bucknell University and planned to pursue a master's in music. Performance majors were required to complete a solo concert at the end of second year, an hour and 15 minutes of performance. Think of it as a musical thesis. Practice jumped to eight hours a day, each and every day, in addition to a normal course load. When it was all over, I was burnt out. Joy had been replaced by a workmanlike rigor. I didn't touch the, the keyboard for the rest of the school year, and that was the first signal. I worked during school breaks, and that summer returned to a media company in the city in an entry-level role. I always felt the excitement and energy from business. I caught the bug early from dad, listening raptly as a little girl to his stories at the dinner table. Tales of bosses, coworkers, production problems, travel all over the world. We commuted together that summer and talked about our days on the way home. I liked the pace, the people, and the work. That was the second signal. It was crunch time that summer, and for those of you familiar with the movie Sliding Doors, it was one of those moments. I ended up informing the Masters of Music program I wouldn't be there in September and started the MBA at Fordham. Why Fordham? I was working, so it had to be night school, and the location, program, and culture suited me. The combination of an academic setting and students working full time was terrific. We tackled concepts and issues with pragmatism and experience. They were tempered and informed by real life. We understood that situations are more nuanced and complicated than case studies present. And I like the scrappiness, diversity, and lack of pretension of the school. Arnell just talked about the cultural fit and how it inspires. These strengths permeate the Gabelli School today and I'm proud to add that my daughter started at the law school this year. Julia is over there with her girlfriend, Lindsay. A Fordham MBA and the connections forged there served me well as I spent 25 years at a global consumer company, the last 10 at Emigrant Bank, and a director on public company boards. As Father McShane said, Fordham and Emigrant have a shared history. 
The bank was founded by the Irish Emigrant Society, a philanthropic group formed in 1841 to advise, aid, and protect Irish immigrants from fraud and abuse. The society acquired banking experience through the handling of passage tickets to and from Ireland and opened a savings bank when refugees from the Irish famine started arriving in great numbers. With the encouragement of New York's first Catholic Archbishop, John Hughes, the founder of Fordham University, Emigrant Industrial Savings Bank was incorporated in 1850. And by 1857, 80% of its depositors were born in Ireland. The bank underwrote the construction of St. Patrick's Cathedral and remains an active, active contributor. It's not just a founder we have in common, but a commitment to community, excellence, achievement, and diversity. Institutions with a legacy of providing first generation with resources and tools to help build their lives and realize their dreams. Now I will talk about giving. Economists, social scientists, and psychologists who study the motivation behind giving have concluded that we are mostly driven by emotional motives and impulse, and that impulse does not exactly square with thinking in calculating terms. In fact, their studies suggest the more one plans, the less generous one becomes. Indeed, giving is deeply personal and can spring from emotions, passions, and spirituality, a sense of community, gratitude, and empathy. It can be about advocacy, a desire to fuel or accelerate change and innovation, a wish to leave a mark, pay it forward, or simply feel good. During this summit, others may talk about differences in giving between men and women. While interesting, I don't think it should matter. However, I do see in your folders a piece about control, confidence, and courage. If you find that data, gives you a sense of control, confidence, and courage, that's great. But what matters is why you give, why one gives. And based on the fact that you are here, it means we have a common desire to be intentional and responsible and share a common interest in the success and sustainability of Fordham. So, notwithstanding the warnings of the psychologists and social scientists, I'm gonna plunge in and my comments are about being planful, as I believe we can be both generous and smart. First, let's start with motivation. I ask you to think about your interests, beliefs, and passions, what you care about. In Tierney and Fleischmann's book, Give Smart, Philanthropy That Gives, Gets Results, they organize this around five Ps. These include giving to people, specific groups or individuals, sometimes in those in difficult circumstances, problems, perhaps ones that have touched your life, places, improving, preserving, sustaining for future generations, as this would be with Fordham, pathways, a particular approach to dealing with problems or social issues, and philosophy, a belief about how the world works or should work. Next, consider the social side. Do you want to go it alone, or prefer the company and collaboration of like-minded souls? An example of the latter is Fordham's Giving Circle, or some of you have participated in something like Habitat for Humanity, where you're working together. Then establish a budget, the same way you would for other major categories of spend. Focus and don't spread yourself thin. And think about the resources you are willing and able to commit. In philanthropy circles, and it was just mentioned earlier, they use a shorthand for this, time, talent, and treasure. It sometimes may involve one, two, or sometimes all three. This may also include your network and relationships. You have to think about, are you also seeking professional development, involvement in a not-for-profit? I was talking to someone during coffee. Um, can enhance your skills and help your career. Service on a board of a nonprofit can be a launch pad for public company board service. It was for me. 
Consider choosing organizations that will do the most with your money. Sometimes this means giving local, where a modest contribution goes a long way. Consult Charity Navigator or other trusted source to verify the integrity and authenticity of an organization. Bloomberg Philanthropies has a saying, in God we trust, everyone else bring data. <laughs> Look for the percent of funds that go to overhead, signs of fiscal responsibility, and evidence of good <clears throat> governance. Remember, when you are lending your, you are re lending your reputation when you get involved. Leave room to help friends and family. It may not be tax deductible, but this is giving too, and can have high impact and bring great personal satisfaction. Also, learn how to say no. Alternatives can include, this isn't in my giving plan. Just think about it, that sounds so impressive. You have a giving plan. This isn't in my giving plan. And assume, once you're involved, you will be asked to go to the next level. The organizers would not be doing their job if they did not ask that. Again, you, you are in control. Another reasonable response is, I'm comfortable where I'm at and will let you know if I want to increase. That kind of worked with hope, not completely. <laughs> um, start children early. Include them in your activities. Encourage them to be involved at school. Suggest a portion of money earned. Go to a favorite cause. Consider giving them a gift directed at enabling them to choose their own way. I did that a couple of years ago with Julia, and she researched different things that she was interested in and had a great time giving. Consistent with the Gabelli ethos of bringing concepts down to earth and in preparation for this talk, I applied some of these questions to my own giving. What follows may appear a bit calculating, but I simply followed my interests and took broad strokes at how much to give. This slide depicts a distribution of my giving. It maps to what I care about, and I also marked areas when I'm, where I'm more involved than simply giving money. My top category is higher education. I believe education is foundational and a gateway to personal development and fulfillment. Affordability of college, and higher education curriculum for the 21st century, and support for faculty and facilities are major opportunities. Father McShane talked about the gift of reading, giving somebody the world and the rest of their life. This is what we're talking about. I give to Bucknell and Fordham. At Bucknell, contributions are directed to the music school, at Fordham, the Gabelli School, and probably the law school soon. This is also where I commit time and talent. I've been a trustee at Bucknell for six years, most recently elected to a vice chairman of the board, and more recently re-engaged with Fordham, thanks to Hope. Fordham's giving circle model is to pledge a gift over four years and gain the benefit of pacing, collective success, focusing a gift on one institution, giving in a very tangible and human way with students, and connecting and bonding with others. Arts and Sciences includes contributions to the Metropolitan Opera. It's a personal passion, and although a major share of my giving, it's small change for the Met. This category also includes museums and other institutions dedicated to preserving history and evidence with admittedly a political and societal bent. For instance, this includes the Museum of Natural History, the New African American Museum in DC, and the US Holocaust Museum. Health included my service on the board of a medical research organization, another area where I committed significant time and resources. It also includes fundraising events for a number of other organizations, usually walks and runs, for medical conditions impacting loved ones. Local includes the library and fire department in my small town in rural Connecticut, where a gift really goes a long way. This includes money and the donation of a pickup truck for first responders. Friends and family is a catch-all and I've been grateful for the ability to assist people at pivotal and private times in their lives. This includes helping family friends with children's tuition, 
someone else with credit card debt, paying for therapy not covered by insurance, and helping someone pay for substance abuse sessions which they didn't want to submit to their employer. The last category, the environment, human, and women's rights, is about personal advocacy, solving problems, back to the five Ps, and finding new pathways. This is my way of advancing ideas to improve our world. And that is exactly what is uniquely gratifying about giving. I hope you have a fabulous day at this second annual Women's Philanthropy Summit. And please, never doubt you can make a difference. People who give always believe that something wonderful is about to happen. Thank you, and I believe we have time for questions.